Thank you. Our big brands are Diamond Crown, made for us by the Fuente family in the Dominican Republic. We have a factory in Nicaragua. We're making 100,000 cigars a day. Brickhouse, Pearl Del Mar, Quorum. And here in our factory in Tampa, we're making 60,000 cigars a day. Rigoletto, Trader Jack's, a brand called Factory Throwouts, which is the worst name for a cigar, except it really sells. So we've, uh, we have three factories that make our cigars, two we own, and one is owned by our partner, the Fuente family. 1875, my grandfather, J.C. Newman, was born in a little village in a brick house in Hungary. And when he was 13, he came over to America in search of the American dream. He came with his mother, father, four brothers, two sisters, settled in Cleveland. There's a big Hungarian district in Cleveland. Couldn't speak, couldn't speak English, had to get a job. His brothers became tailors, so that's what immigrants did. They made clothes. He didn't want to make clothes, so his mother paid a cigar maker $3 a month to teach his son how to make cigars. He became a good cigar apprentice in 1890, and he was laid off in the mid, about 1893, 1894, big recession in Cleveland. Laid off all the cigar makers. And he's sitting around home one day, and his mother, who wore the pants of the family, would go to the grocer and tell the grocer, I buy all my groceries from you. Because back in those days, there was no refrigeration. Women bought their groceries every day. She uh, asked the grocer, give him an order, give her an order. So she came home with an order for 500 cigars. My grandfather had to borrow $50 from who else? His mother. Bought two bales of tobacco, find some old boards, for the family barn and one into a one-man cigar factory. My grandfather was a great talker, better than I am. He got an order for 2,500 cigars from the local saloon, then he got an order for 10,000 cigars from Cleveland's largest wholesale grocer. He got so many orders, he couldn't make them all himself, so he hired some of his other buddies, who were also laid off in 1894, to come work for him. This, so it's in May of 1895, is when he started in business. Life was great. 20 years old, five employees, had a good business. May of 1895, work in the family barn. Winter comes, we're in Cleveland. Barn's not heated, it's cold in Cleveland. So he moves his whole operation to the family basement. After a couple of weeks, her mother, his mother discovered that her fruits and vegetables, which she can't for the winter, start to taste like tobacco. She kicks him out of the house, has all of his rollers, has to set up, set up a storefront in downtown Cleveland. And um, by 1905, he had the biggest factory in Cleveland. At one time, they had 200 factories in Cleveland. So then he went from a bigger factory in Cleveland in 1915. Good business. In 1917, the Chamber of Commerce from Marion, Ohio, about 45 minutes from Cleveland, came to see my grandfather wanted him to build a factory in Marion. Actually, they were going to build a factory for him if he'd just come hire the people who work for him. Everybody's looking for jobs. So my grandfather, they built a factory for him in Marion. He operated a few years. The guy that came to see him was a guy named Warren Harding. Later became Ohio Center, later, later became President of the United States. In fact, my grandfather used to visit President Harding in the White House, not because they're that good of friends, but President Harding used to like get free cigars. Still in Cleveland, big recession in Cleveland in the 1920s. My grandfather merges with another company called the Mendelssohn Company, the last two factories in Cleveland. Mendelssohn wanted his name first in the merger. My grandfather wanted to be the boss, so he became president. So my grandfather said, okay, we can call it Mendelssohn first, be Mendelssohn and Newman. My grandfather knew that Mendelssohn and Newman was a mouthful, so they sh he knew after a while the name would be shortened to M&N, which it was. And my grandfather's name was called M&N Cigar back then, 1928. In 1939, my grandfather bought out Mr. Mendelssohn. And we've had total control of that business ever since. We're in Cleveland. There's two cigar booms in our industry's history. One was in the 90s when Scarface Sonato came out. The other was in world, during World War II. 
Uncle Sam brought 35% of every scar manufacturer's production. So you just open up your doors and imagine you're making widgets and 35% of your widgets are already sold that day. You know, life was pretty good. Life was great. As far as business is concerned, war is tough. After the war, the government wanted to return all the scars they, they, they bought. And that wasn't so good. My grandfather told the government, you bought them, you keep them. And they didn't even keep them in air conditioned or humidified warehouse. They just kept them up there. And the government said, Mr. Newman, you should take these scars back. Because what's going to happen is we're going to sell them to a liquidator for maybe 10 cents on the dollar. They're going to sell them to a, one of your wholesale candy and tobacco distributors for maybe 50 cents on the dollar. You're going to have to take them back. Plus the fact, Mr. Newman, you don't want all these bad cigars, dry cigars with your bands on. You better take them back. So my grandfather grudgingly took them back in the 1946, 47. Business was tough. My father, who joined the business in 1934 when he was going to college in Cleveland, used to travel with my grandfather to Cuba every couple months. And they're down there in 1947, and my father's watching them harvest tobacco. The tobacco grows maybe six feet, and they'll pick tobacco in different primings. But the top of the tobacco, they'll just plow under because it was heavy tobacco that wasn't that good, or so they thought. So my father had an idea. He goes to the farmer says, this tobacco at the top of the plant that you're plowing under, would you sell to us at a low price? And they said, sure, because there's no value to us. We'll sell it to you for 75 cents a pound. It's very inexpensive. So my father bought that tobacco, it came out with a cigar called Cameo. In the early, late, late 40s, early 50s, the nickel cigar was a sweet spot for all cigars. And my, grandf my father came out with Cameo using this Cuban tobacco, and it became the number one selling nickel cigar in the entire Midwest. They're going to making a million cigars a week. Selling million cigars, we can save our factory because after the before we had Cameo, we had all these cigars coming back from the government. Saved our company, and my grandfather and my father took a selling trip around 1950. They visited a wholesale candy tobacco distributor called Niles and Moser. They had 50 warehouses, distributing warehouses, all up and down the Midwest, Kansas, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma. And Mr. Moser said, Mr. Newman. We love your cameo. We don't make your cameo. Our company, Nickel Cigar. I'm going to give you an order for half a million cigars a week. My father was ecstatic. It was his baby. Goes, leaves the office, leaves the mini, calls the office. I mean, as soon as he's out of the room, my grandfather says, Well, thank you for the order. But come Monday, it's going to six cents because we aren't many, making any money on nickel. And Mr. Moser says, Mr. Newman, we don't want a six cent cigar. We want your cameo to be our company's nickel cigar. My grandfather's pretty stubborn. My father came to the office, came from the, uh, into the meeting, who was going on, he used to be tied. But he couldn't talk my grandfather for, into not raising the price. Sure enough, they raised the price from a nickel to six cents, lost half their business in three months. Then they tried to bring the cigar price back to nickel, it was too late. They lost their business, they lost their customers. Anyway, many, many, a lot, lot, lot of different stories. In the early 50s, still in Cleveland, there was five big cigar companies in the United States trying to run the little guys, like my grandfather, out of the business. The big guys would grow their own tobacco. Maybe it cost them three dollars a pound. But they'd go to offer the farmer six dollars a pound for a little bit of their needs, which they could certainly average down with what they grew themselves. But they set this fictitiously high market price at six dollars a pound for those that didn't grow their own tobacco, like my grandfather, had to pay this price almost double what, what the market was so they could no longer compete with the big guys. So my grandfather said we could no longer stay in the scar business unless we find the niche of the scar business where the big guys aren't in. And in the early 50s they're making mass market cigars. So my grandfather said we should get in the premium scar business because the big guys weren't in there. So in the early 50s there's only one section in the United States making premium cigars. That was Tampa, Florida. So at the age of 78, my grandfather moved his whole operation from Cleveland to Tampa in this factory where we've, ever, where we've been ever since. Tampa one time had 150 cigar companies, 150 factories. By the time we got here, it was down to 10. But 10 strong family-owned companies all making Cuban cigars. Cuban filler, Cuban binder, 
Cuban rapper. And life was pretty good until January 1961, when President Kennedy declares the Cuban embargo. And that was the beginning of the end of the Tampa Scar industry as we know it. The Tampa Scar industry came from Key West, just to digress a minute. And 18, uh, Key West industry started in Key West, America's cigar industry from Cuba. And in around 1884, 1885, they had labels, labor struggles in Key West. So the cigar, cigar barons wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. They wanted to move. They're looking for a place, not too far from Key West, placed in at a seaport, bring tobacco in from Cuba, placed at a ro railroad line in, to New York, so you can sell your cigars up in, to, to New York, have a uh, chamber of commerce that wanted the cigar industry. We went in Tampa at that time, had the Board of Trade, which is like today's chamber of commerce, and also a climate that was similar to Key West, similar to Cuba. And if you're from Tampa or Orlando, you know that 10 months out of the year, we live in a natural humidor. 10 months out of the year, it's hot and it's humid. So in 1885, one by one, the factories started moving, not only from Key West, but from Chicago, New York, all over the country. And it's high in the 1930s. Tampa had 150 cigar factories making over half a million, five, over 500 million cigars a year. But for a number of reasons, mechanization comes in, the handmade business goes out. We're still in having 10 big factories here. We moved here in 1954. The embargo comes. One by one, all the Tampa Scar factories close. They merge other companies, they sell out, they open factories off, offshore. So it's just us now in Tampa. In, 19, in 2007, Congress put the biggest cigar, biggest tax on our industry, biggest tax in American business. They raised our taxes, federal excise taxes, from a nickel to 40 cents for a sale. So the only other factory that was left was Havitampa. Havitampa had sold a few years earlier to the Spanish Tobacco Monopoly. We had a factory in Puerto Rico. So they closed Tampa, they closed their Tampa operation. So now Havitampas are made in San Juan, Puerto Rico. We're the last operating scar factory in Tampa. Actually, the last traditional scar factory in America. There was, my grandfather started in business. There are 42,000 licensed scar manufacturers. 1895, 42,000 licensed scar manufacturers. You have to have a license to make cigars. Why? In order to pay federal excise tax, even 1895. Today, we're the only one of those 42,000 cigar manufacturers from 1895 that are still owned and operated by the founding family. We are it. It's been a struggle. We've been through two world wars, the Great Depression, Cuban embargo, smoking bans, increasing taxes, now we're fighting FDA regulation. It's been a challenge, one challenge after another. We've been able to persevere, staying in business all this time because we were able to reinvent ourselves. A lot of changes, we were able to embrace change. The business uh, was really difficult in the mid-1980s. The industry business was going down five or six percent a year, and it was difficult. We were a family business. My grandfather had four kids. He had, uh, my father ran manufacturing, my uncle ran the sales, and the sisters collected dividends. Come the 70s, the 80s, you got a third generation of Newmans coming in. You know, there's a reason why family businesses don't go from one generation to the second generation to the third generation. In the 70s and 80s, new third generation Newmans coming in, needed to have, have families, have kids. We needed more from the business. At the time, the business sucked. The, the, the business was able to give less and less. So it was decided that one side of the family had to buy out the other side. My father owned a third, my uncle owned a third, and the sisters owned a third. One third bought out two thirds. My father bought out the other relatives. They got the money. We got the debt, the opportunity. For about five years, I thought they got the best part of the deal. Some decisions are made with the head, and some are made with the heart. I thought our heart got in the way of the head, but it worked out. In the early 90s, uh, scars became very stylish, very popular. Scar Fishing came out, gave credibility to the industry, brought a lot of scar smokers out of the closet. Scars are so popular, every movie star, every athlete wanted their own cigar. It was like hula hoops and cabbage patch towels all rolled into one. It's like the dot com 
except dot com bubble had a couple more zeros attached to it. The scars were really trendy. So many companies went public, then they ended up going private. The business peaked in the 19, 1997 was the peak of the cigar boom. But during the cigar boom, there's a hundred factories that opened up overnight from Honduras, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic. After the boom, 95 of them closed. It, it was real, it was a really like the wild, wild west. The secret to making a good cigar is using aged tobacco. But there's no extra aged tobacco when the cigar boom came, so the price of tobacco kept going up, doubling every six months for a couple of years, which is we just had to raise our prices. It was you could put crap in a bag called a cigar and it would sell. Cigars were that popular. Demand was going like this, supply was going like you know like this, but eventually supply caught up with the demand and. The end of 97, that was the end of the cigar boom. Cigar is still a popular business, but it leveled off. A lot of people were exiting the business in the, in the early 2000s. Some new people came in as well. And um, kind of funny story. We bought our company in 18, 1986. My brother, father, and I did. We had bought out the relatives. Remember, they got the money, we got the debt. In fact, not only did we have the debt, our balance sheet had negative equity, meaning, if you know about accounting, look at a balance sheet, our assets were less than our liabilities. It's supposed to be the other way. We had negative net net worth. Fortunately, we closed the deal on Valentine's Day, 18, 1986. Three weeks later, my father got a call from one of his old Tampa Sky manufacturer buddies who had opened up a factory in six years earlier in the Dominican Republic. He also had a factory in Tampa, a machine-made factory. And this fella said, Stan, I have a great factory at the Dominican Republic, I want to, but I want to close my operation in Tampa. It's a pain in the butt. Didn't call it butt, but it's a pain in the butt. And he asked my father if we'd be interested in making his machine made cigars on our machines. And Dad said, yes, but we just bought the business. And, and Dad said, how about making cigars for us, handmade cigars? So if we're going to stay in the business, we had to get the handmade cigar business. So that was the start of our relationship with a family called Carlos Fuente, father and son. They started to make a, back in 19, 18, 1986, cigars were sold two ways. The good stuff was in boxes, the factory seconds were put in bundles. We came up with a concept, what if we put a premium cigar in a bundle where the customer didn't have to pay for the boxes, the bands, the fancy trimmings, in essence passing a, a value proposition to the customer. We came up with a brand called La Unica. Within six months, we became the number one selling bundle of cigar in the country. Then we were making Cuesta Ray cigars here. We started to go from Tampa Bay Cuesta Ray, now made by Fuentes in the Dominican Republic in, 18, in 1988. Then we got the cigar boom. So within, uh, in 1990, we formed another partnership with the Fuente family. Their strength was manufacturing. They had the best cigar factory in the world, still do. But they never had their own sales organization. They sold through brokers. Brokers represented a bunch of different brands. Our strength was sales and distribution back in 1990, but we never had our own handmaking factory. So we decided to form a partnership. It was back that time as Fuente Newman, now Arturo Fuente Cigar Company, where our salesmen would sell their cigars and our cigars in the marketplace. They call it a smoke shop. Same token, Fuente and his factory would make our cigars, our Diamond Crown and the Fuente cigars in their factory. So they got a chance to focus on what they do best. We got a chance to concentrate on what, what we do best. Started this in, eight, in November 1st of 1990, the distribution. We've been still doing that to this very day for uh, almost uh, 30 years. So it's, and we've been, they've been making cigars for us since uh, 18 since 1986, which is 33 years. So we've been at this thing, partnership a long time. In uh, in um, 2003, we started buying some cigars from a factory in Nicaragua to make a value price bundle cigar. It became a big part of our business, so we built a factory in 2011. We have a brand called Quorum. Quorum today is the number one selling bundle cigar in the country, and in also along those times in 2007, came off a brand called Brickhouse. My grandfather was born in a little village, a Brickhouse, a little village in Hungary. One of his first brands, and he came to the United States, was called Brickhouse, daughter where he's born. 
brand died out in the 30s. We brought it back in 2007, honor his heritage, honor his legacy. Rick House today is one of our, is our top selling long filler, Nicaraguan cigar. We came out with uh, Pro de, de, de Del Mar. We have a nice factory, busy factory, second largest factory in Nicaragua. And we have today Diamond Crown made for us by Fuente and fourth generation. My son Drew, very involved in the business. He's our attorney. He used to be a regulator in Washington, D.C. Our biggest challenge now is fighting FDA. He used to be a legislative director for one of the county commissioners, city councilman in Washington, D.C. Now he's come over from the dark side to the good side, we're fighting FDA regulation. They want to regulate us out of business, and not maybe not intentionally. They look, they want to make this a smoke-free society. They they want to get rid of all smoking. They're mainly concerned about youth access to tobacco and addiction to tobacco. They're concerned about kids smoking. The kids don't smoke cigars. They don't smoke premium cigars. And kids are smoking today somebody behind the schoolhouse. It's not premium cigars. Smoking either cigarettes or jewels or marijuana or weed, whatever. But in Washington, it's so more convenient to pass this law that covers everybody one size fits all. One, one one hundredth of one percent of all tobacco products sold in this country, one one hundredth of one percent are premium cigars. We're trying to carve a niche, and it's uh, we've been battling Congress, we've been battling FDA. They're concerned about addiction. There's smoking laws in the United States. You can't smoke in any public building, inside anywhere. No, you're outside an office building. You never see anybody smoking a cigar. They're always smoking cigarettes. Cigar smokers can go, can smoke two cigars a day, two cigars a week, two cigars a year without going into any withdrawals. Because they smoke cigars because they enjoy the flavor, the taste, the camaraderie with, with their fellow cigar smokers, not because they're hooked on cigars. You know, cigarette smokers, they can't go two hours without smoking a cigarette because they're physiologically dependent upon the nicotine. And cigars are not inhaled, so there's no dependency factor on cigars. But FDA has this agenda to regulate all of us out of business. And we've been fighting back. Since 2011, we've had bills through Congress to exempt premium cigars, like the kind we make in our factory here from regulation by FDA. Haven't been successful yet. Right now, we have over 50 congressmen signed on a bill that was put out uh, a couple months ago, Santa Rubio in the House. Santa Rubio's put out a bill in the Senate. He's got co-sponsors to exempt premium cigars from, from regulation. You know, President Trump came in. One of the things he was touting how over-regulation kills small business. There's no better example of regulation kills small business than what Washington is doing with us today. We become an unintended consequence. If we go out of business, no big deal to them. This next year's 125th year in business. 20, 125 consecutive years by same family making cigars, making a product. There's so little manufacturing left in this country. We're making cigars today on antique cigar machines that my grandfather used in the 1930s. We're also making cigars downstairs by hand, same way my grandfather made them 124 years ago. There's no product around in our country today that's still made the same way it was made in the 1800s, except cigars. It's a craft product. Uh, people enjoy like the joy of a glass of wine. You know, it's, and wine's a good analogy because you have different grapes, different vintages, different years, and cigars are the, are, are the same way, but we're fighting the, these reg regulations. We can't come up with a new blend. We can't change the number of cigars in our boxes. FDA wants to put these massive health warnings to cover up a third of our packages, of our labels. Look, there's on cigarettes, little health warning on the side. They want to cover up a third of our, our packages. They want us to test for cigars and tell them what's in them. We're supposed to turn these test results over to them in November. Only one problem with that. They haven't told us what they want to test for. Actually, there's two problems with it. First, they haven't told us what they want to test for, and two, machines don't exist to test cigars like cigarettes. Cigar cigarettes come in four or five different shapes. 
They're all about the same. So you can have cigarette testing machines. Cigars are over a thousand shapes. FDA has the right to take anything off the market that we introduced in the last 12 years unless we can prove it's substantially equivalent. Those are their words to what we were making before 2007, though they haven't told us what the word substantially equivalent means. We think it's just tobacco. Is it the blend? Is it the flavor? Is it what? And uh, the flavor changes over the years. Cigars flavor can be an active guide. If you get a rainy crop, it'll be thin. If you get not much rain, a drought, it'll be thicker tobacco, a little heavier cigar. So it's the good Lord that oftentimes determines the taste and blend of a cigar. I think FDA might want to go after the, the good Lord if they had a chance. We had great employees here. We have 125 employees here. They all have families to feed. They all have mortgages to pay. We go to Washington and went there been going there for 20 years. First was to get make sure we didn't this big, big cigar tax that put up our business for S chip, and now we're fighting with reg regulation. We go to Washington, walk calls of Congress. We aren't asking for an earmark. We aren't asking for a tax credit. All we are asking is just to be left alone to make our payroll, to make cigars, to do what we've been doing since the 1800s. Is that too much to ask? We don't want any more government interference. Don't get me wrong. Some regulation in life is good. I don't want to have food that's tainted. I don't want a medicine that's not, that's not made, made right. I don't want to get lead paint from China. But overregulation kills small business, and that's what we're fighting. 1995, my son is 14, 13. He said, Daddy, we have to have a website. That's fine, son. What's a website? Mid-90s. Dad, we have to have one. So we and our partners work together, and we start a website. Who are we? We are Cigar Family. So we start CigarFamily.com, and it became the very most popular website within six months after it was launched. We had a chat room on there. We predated Facebook. People would get in a chat room, they talk to each other all day long. In fact, they worked for me, they'd probably be fired, but they would they love each other. 1998, my son drew 16 at the time, says, Dad, these people want to meet each other. That's fine, son. No, they want to have a reunion, they want to meet each other in Tampa. Well, that's nice, that's not gonna happen. Dad, they want to meet each other. Drew's pretty persistent, like like his mother sometimes. And so we so okay, we invite everybody in our chat room to meet each other. We had like 60, 70 people there. And they never met each other. They knew each other by handles. And we had a three-day weekend. We went to visit cigar stores. We went to the Devil Ray game. We had different speakers. And that was called Cigar Family Celebration. We called CFC. And we met almost every year in Tampa. Then we went to Clearwater, St. Petersburg been to New Orleans and one year 1999 I'm riding with my friend partner brother Carlos Fuente there was tobacco fields and we see these kids playing in the street I said Carlos why aren't that why aren't they in school he says because there's not enough classrooms in here in this little rural area of the Dominican, one of the most impoverished areas of the Dominican Republic they're in double session still enough classrooms so we said, why don't we build a little wing on a school? We've came through a cigar boom. We owed it to the people of the Dominican Republic to thank them for growing the best tobacco, making the best cigars in the world. Went a little further, we saw these girls carrying jugs of water on their shoulder. I said, Carlos, what are you doing? He says, well, you don't believe it, but there's no drinking water in these, in their huts, in their homes, their huts. He says, even then, so the girls walk as much as two miles, and the boys too, carrying water from the river to their homes, and still the water is not fit to, to drink. And I said, you know, that's awful. We should give them clean drinking water. So Carlos and I, we started to, a cigar family charitable foundation. Actually, this, the foundation was started before we had this idea in mind of just giving back, except we thought we should give back because we had a good run in the business world. And so we wanted to build a wing on a school and 
provide clean drinking water. And Carlos met a fellow who was head of the largest humanitarian organization in the Dominican Republic. Here we are, a bunch of gringos. We want to give you clean drinking water. We want to build a women's school. He says, no, you don't. You want to build your own school. You don't want to get involved with the government. So we, so we started fundraising. We started, uh, built the Scar Family Project in the Dominican Republic. We had this foundation we started, about 23 acres, and then one of the poorest areas of the Dominican Republic. We opened up our primary school in 2004, September 6th, had grand opening, pre-K through eighth grade. Great day, we had all the media, the politicians, the parents there, great day. About six months later, Carlos called me and says, we have a problem in our school. He says, we can't have a problem in our school, everybody loves us. He said, the problem is a bunch of eighth grade girls got a hold of Carlos and said, we love our school, but the closest, the closest high school is an hour away walking. We have to build a high school. He said, Carlos, we have no money to build a high school. Doesn't matter, we have to build a high school. So he and I signed a note for a million dollars at the Bank of Tampa to build a high school. Fortunately, we raised money, it was paid back because our name was on that. We opened up a high school in 2005, medical clinic in 2006. Now we have over 5,000 kids and their parents using our project in the Dominican Republic. And that became a rallying cry for our cigar family. So our cigar family reunion group would start at Tampa at the Marriott, uh, Airport Marriott on Cyprus. Now every year, almost every year, we go back to visit our project in the, Domin in the Dominican Republic. They're all part of cigar family. Anybody can be part of cigar family. Anybody that smokes cigars, or even if they don't smoke cigars, they believe in helping people. Part of cigar family. Go down there, nowhere on that project does it say Newman, does it say Fuente, it says cigar family. And it's really, really a special place. It's given more purpose to bring all of our cigar family people to, uh, together. My grandfather started as J.C. Newman Cigar Company, 1895. Merged with Grover Mendelson, changed the company to M&M. In 1997, the height of the cigar boom, we go to trade shows and we see all these new companies and they said, I've been in business for three years, buy my cigars. I've been in business for three months, buy my cigars. You know, I've been in business for three weeks, buy my cigars. You know, we were, we were at that time being in business for 102 years. So we, uh, my father one time met Walter Chrysler, made an impression. So we wanted to put our, go back to our roots, put our, for our family name back on our company. We got rid of m and We went back to J.C. Newman. So when a Newman calls on a customer, it means something versus just being a, an employee of, of m and So we've been uh, J.C. Newman for, since 1997. It's for competitive purposes for brand identity. It's my son, son's idea. We, we want to have Jason Newman branded everywhere. We don't have a Newman cigar. We have a Newman cigar family. We have a Newman story. So we are branding everything Jason Newman, helping tell our story. It's a competitive world out there. During, up and through the 1980s, the only way we could grow our business is to go and steal our competitors' customers. And guess what? They're trying to steal our customers. Then the cigar boom comes, the whole, the whole world, the whole the market opens up. And now we're back that for competitive purposes, our customers, our competitors are trying to steal our customers. We're trying to steal their customers. We think by going back to our roots, telling our story, well, they may have been in business for 24 years. We've been in business for 124 years. Same family. So it gives, for a, it, it gives an opportunity to tie everything together our roots that we're making scars the same way my grandfather made them a century ago. We don't give tours to this cigar factory publicly, but we give tours, it seems like, almost every day. Have you been through our factory yet? Walking back in this factory, walking in this factory, walking back in time, making cigars on the same machines my grandfather used, made them in 1930. Talked to a reporter from the Tampa Bay Times, tell her our story, old machine, said, you're using replica machines. 
said, we aren't using replica machines. We're using the exact same machines my grandfather had 90 years. We make cigars by hand. Same way that my grandfather did 124 years ago. This is like walking in a time capsule. Tampa is the cigar city. My son's had an idea for 125th anniversary, help celebrate 125 years in the cigar business, 125 years in any business is monumental. To renovate the factory, Wendy, we have a museum downstairs, we're going to triple the size of our museum, we're going to put in a factory store, we're going to put a handmade scar factory right behind me with 12 rollers and a reader filled with that door like they had 100 years ago. We want to bring tour buses here, wants to help tell the story, just like the Bourbon Trail is in Kentucky, we can become an attraction, he thinks. it's. Nobody has ever gone to this factory and taken a tour and hadn't been blown away by what they've seen. This isn't done anymore. And it's a really special help to, it's also a gift to the community. This is the Cigar City. People, what's Tampa, cigars are Tampa. What wine is to Napa Valley and to Sonoma. What cars are to Detroit. What Mickey Mouse is to Orlando. They have other identity. This is the Cigar City. But we're the only one left. That's why we're fighting so hard against the FDA to keep them from regulating us out of business. We have a story to tell. This is still the Cigar City. And we hope by bringing tourists in, create a lot of buzz, a lot of interest. But we've really got something special here. And uh, once you've seen it, it's really amazing what we've been doing. It's hard to be objective about your own kid, but it's amazing that with all these issues here, we're still... The only thing better than making 60,000 cigars a day in the United States, in this factory, is selling 60,000 cigars a day. So if people like, like what we do, as long as the FDA is not successful and closing us down, hope to do this for another 124 years. See, well, because Tampa is known for, I mean, for, for cigars. Orlando is known for Disney World. So we want to spread the message, spread the love that this was the birthplace, actually wasn't the birthplace Key West was, this has been the Scar City since 1885, and God willing, will continue to be the Cigar City for another 130 years. We've, we've survived everything, the, the wars, the depression, no Cuban tobacco, smoking bans, taxes. We can conquer this regulation. My son is fourth generation, Hope we can have generations to come because it's a great business. Scars are so special. I play golf here in Tampa at a club my father joined many, many years ago when I was six. You give a guy five dollars or ten dollars and he'll say thank you. You give him a cigar, which you can't do anymore because it's not FDA doesn't allow it. The old days, you give a cigar and they bring a smile to the face. You're sharing. You go into a cigar lounge. Nowhere else could you bring two people from different walks of life, different demographics. They sit down. You can have a king, a CEO, somebody, a street sweeper, whatever. Bring them together, and there's a special bond about smoking a cigar. They can talk about all the problems of the world, talk about sports, talk about music, but they start smoking a cigar. It brings people together. We live in a very stressful and hectic world. God knows it is. When you smoke a cigar, all is right with the world. You share it with a friend. You come into the cigar lounge as strangers. You smoke a cigar, you bond, you leave as best friends. There's no other product in the world that can do what cigars can do to help make this world a better place. My grandfather and father have both been innovated. They've never copied. They try to be the first on the block with new inventions, new creations, new promotions, new c c c cigars. I think that as long as we aren't regulated out of business, we have uh, my grandfather's first generation. My father comes in 1934 with a different view of the world, though he and my grandfather clashed. My brother and I come in the, the business in the 1970s, new ideas. My, grand my father listened. My son, Drew, comes in this business with new ideas. The world is changing. As long as we're able to embrace change, see what's going on out there, 
and adapt, we should hopefully be in business for another 124 years. Thank you, JC. Okay, so I'm Michael Paul. <laughs> this is my uh, wife and uh, better half, depending upon who's introducing <laughs> myself or her. And, and then, what day it is. <laughs> and what day it is. And this is Gabe. Gabe, come here. Come here. Gabe. This is our son Gabriel, who is actually um, in training here, manager in training. Um, he's a manager in training. This is Gabriel Paul he wants to get back to his phone. <laughs> and he's making all that background noise while we were filming. And we have a we have a 15 year old daughter named Ellison, uh, who is much too busy to be hanging out with uh, hanging out with us. Much he's a sophomore going to uh, high school and cheerleading squad and then we have a son yet to be named uh, it's on the way so uh, and then we have Carl who's our who's our partner and brother who owns a business in the neighborhood uh, who could not be with us because he's you know, managing his barbershop who's been in Casper he's been in Casper for 19 years um, but that that's our team and family statistics surrounding cigars so We'll take Atlanta for example. Atlanta is um, one of the fifth largest smoking communities in the country. Um, the largest emerging demographic from that is African American women. So <clears throat> it uh, starts to look different from what it used to look like 10, 15 years ago. It starts to look a lot more integrated, not the old boys network, not the man cave-ish sort of things, a lot more interaction, a lot more conversation, um, and then you have a difference in terms of how different establishments function. Uh, we are more of a lounge, a true lounge, with uh, more of experience based than a smoke shop, uh, and then we make uh, crafted cocktails and such to, to add to that experience. Uh, but as far as statistics go, uh, uh, I, would, I would tell you that Atlanta is uh, way ahead of the curve. I believe there's a hundred smoke shops, uh, smoking related venues in, in the near metropolitan, metropolitan area. area. You know, as far as the history of cigars, it was more so a rite of passage from father and son, grandfathers and uncles, the good old boys club smoking. As those uh, demographics shift and you see more African American female smoking cigars, more female smoking cigars, and taking that and making it a little bit more appealing. You also have a younger generation coming into it, so you have more creatives, you have more of these artistic, um, and just, you know, people, just regular, you have a wider variety of people now that have access to a lifestyle. You go into any business in order to, to drive revenue, create impact, build a brand and then at the end of the day make money. Um, I think initially going into it, one does not realize the responsibility of uh, the, your taxes. Um, cigars and alcohol can be a double-edged sword. Um, so to become profitable, you need to first build a brand. You need to have products and services that people are going to come in and support. Then eventually that becomes profitable. Um, we joke all the time that um, you know we built this this great brand, uh, but this is we didn't build it to sort of sustain us from a financial standpoint. Uh, you have to have several brands, particularly of our size, in order to see like major profits. Um, and we again uh, true to our uh, initial vision to become tobacconists. So we're probably you know forty percent of our sales, even though we have a full bar, comes yeah. from uh, sales of, of tobacco. Yeah. And um, consistency and branding, um, as he mentioned initially, those are again, a lot more of the newer terms, like branding and consistency, you know, you've had a lot of Walmart as a brand, a lot of these older, um, a lot of the cigars that you'll see in there are just older, it's a family tradition, small companies, you know, we used to own a tobacco farm, we're passing this on to you. 
you know what, I'm going to box it up and I'm going to market it this way. I'm going to tell the story of the brand in this particular fashion. I'm going to collaborate now with these people. I'm going to now include a spirit line. So as that continues to change and trend and evolve, um, as far as going back to the profits, um, continuing to offer good service, um, offer great, a good product line, and stay consistent to your original message. Like we said, we were going to be a true tobacconist. We're going to focus on craft cocktails. We're going to focus on the experience. That hasn't changed um, for being open for about a, biz a year or so, for being in business for about two years. Um, there's a lot of factors that continue to change. Um, our environment changes around us. The, this industry continues to um, change and evolve as different tobacco taxes and laws are introduced. Like we have to adjust quite a bit. And I think the hospitality industry is very, very resilient, or the people that we build in this industry is very resilient as far as, and we learn, you know, where are our opportunities for us to make more, you know, profit. This business can be profitable. It is just, it's the same as selling food. It's, it's just another uh, service offering. So you have to create the frenzy. Like if you have a restaurant, People just don't come because you all, all of a sudden have food. They have to hear about it. You have to have a presence out there. So then, at that point, things become profitable. The margins are very slim, so in order to be profitable, you have to sort of stay up on, on, on those things. You started smoking. <laughs> so cigar people are very um, engaging, sociable, uh, look for conversation. What we do, uh, we have a visual element of, of the art. And you'll continue to see that there's a lot more diversity and inclusion of different trends, but you don't want to get too trendy. It's a fine balance. Anytime you come into a particular neighborhood, you want to be able to create something that is going to be timeless and something that is accepted by your neighbors. A night such as a Friday where we have live music um, and it will incorporate um, uh, art stroll in there or a Monday night every last Monday of the month we do a bartending competition because we are a craft cocktail lounge we um, bring in a lot of people to co compete create cocktails and industry people come in on those nights and support it so you have music then you'll have uh, industry supporting it through through the cocktail piece uh, so it makes for, for a fun evening so we program the space a little bit different than most places would yeah, we'll take, we'll have days, um, you know, just we'll focus on Bastille Day. You know, everybody's going to focus on restaurants and bars. Cinco de Mayo is huge. It's uh, National Rum Day today. Nas yeah, National Rum Day. Like, you know what, and then so, and then we talk about, you know, what really resonates with us individually. Like, and I'm from India, so we have Bollywood parties in here quite often where we bring a dancer. We'll have, we'll pass out little biddies. Um, we bring, you know, we, we put little pieces of us um, in here into our programming. Um, we have our, our, like Michael was saying earlier, we have a cocktail um, competition once a month where we allow anybody, who, anybody and everybody to jump behind the bar and compete. They can make drinks. <laughs> that, yeah, to compete, that can make drinks. And it's very well received. It's not a very pretentious environment. So everyone at any level is always well received and comfortable no matter who you are because I like when it comes to you know being a respecter of man I don't think we're really like we're gonna not give you what's overdue and then not what you know it's pretty even so young man young lady and to her and to her point you know because of the diversity in age race demographic things of that nature C cigars are, it almost goes back to one of the original questions you asked about cigars so cigars are of the people it's like wine People put a lot of pretense around it, you know, the sophistication related to that. It's not. People call here and ask about a dress code. Uh, clothes are fine. You know, we don't have, you know, guys coming from the golf course in shorts. Uh, you come from the neighborhood and you've got, you know, sneakers on with, with a ball cap. I mean, we're, we're not that type of place. We're a place that's open to and serving all. Um, and but there is a sense of decorum here because of how we conduct ourselves. And correct. it goes back to our consistency. You know, this is what we look like. This is what we sound like. You know, we don't say, hey, we don't, you know, you know, 
We'll wait until you say, excuse me, miss. Oh yes, how may I help you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just we're, we're very, we're proper. So I guess just sort of take on the tone that we put out there. And, and educators, you know, most of the cigar places that you go to, um, and we tout ourselves as educators, but most places you go to, they want people to understand the culture and understand what it is that they're, that they're doing. You know, people will come in, well, I smoke this, but I don't smoke that. Um, you know, I smoke marijuana, but I, I, I smoke cigarettes and smoke a cigar. How is that different? You know, and just walking them through the steps because it's it's our um, our reasonable service as hospitalians to sort of share our knowledge with people in order for them to feel comfortable, uh, you know, being that consumer. So an educated consumer is uh, our best customer. Cy Sim said that. I don't know if you guys remember Cy Sims. He owned a suit company back in the like 70s. But yeah, an educated consumer is our best customer. So you feel good about and you have knowledge around the product. You know, it's like when you go to a restaurant and you have this great server that's like, oh, you should try this drink. These are what I like on their menu. You should try this. Well, how do you like it? You know, versus them just taking an order. They're creating an experience for you. So that's what we try to do here. I, I think we do a good job with that. And I think most of the places here in Atlanta, some of the places I've been in DC, um, Tampa, Miami, I think most places I've gone into um, still provide that. Uh, but it may be different, a different execution, but it's, it's still the same sort of uh, helpful, knowledgeable, um, welcoming sort of vibe. And I think that's the rise in popularity with cigar lounges now becoming, popping up, you know, because it, it, it targets and caters to a certain demographic that's not, you know, we're not, the bars offer a certain environment and ambiance. And then cigar lounges offer a completely different ambiance. It's not as fast paced. You know, you still want to enjoy yourself, but you want to enjoy a good drink, a nice cocktail, a nice cigar, a nice meal. Uh, a lot of these restaurants are, offer meals, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it's it's a different experience, and I think it allows people to sort of slow down. You know, you've got to, and there's there's. You gotta respect a person that says, you know, I have about an hour to spend for me to unwind and take that me time for myself, just so I can collect my thoughts, be a little introspective, or just, you know, want to commune with someone not in a loud space, you know, just it, it, and just sort of really engage people. So the engagement portion of it is what's what's um, as attract what's attractive and appealing so many people who are looking to create the experience and then also wanting to experience the industry. If you're ever in Atlanta, that you could come visit us at Havana Cigar Lounge, um, where we take your experience to a level of art.